Amen. So Acts chapter 8, look down at uh, the story of the Ethiopian eunuch and Philip. So we're going to talk about um, this story this evening, and I'm going to answer uh, a lot of, uh, or talk about at least, a lot of uh, deep philosophical questions that, I, that as a satellite leader I wouldn't have touched with a 10-foot pole. You know, some things as a satellite leader you're just like, okay, I don't deserve to uh, be able to have an opinion on that. Uh, but now as a, as a pastor, I can kind of give you my thoughts on some of these um, questions and things that people have asked. Um, but anyway, I was talking to somebody before I even get into that story. Look at verse 13. I was talking to somebody at Sure Foundation, and they talked to me. They were saying that um, they knew a pastor or a, a certain denomination that it was kind of a, a controversy on whether Simon the sorcerer was saved or not. And I was like, well, they must not have had a King James Bible because uh, verse 13 says, then Simon himself believed also. So that's pretty clear right there that Simon... Uh, the sorcerer uh, was saved, and he was baptized, and of course, uh, we'll find out um, that you're only baptized after you're saved um, in this story with Philip. So anyway, um, who knows what all the different Bible versions um, changed um, that verse into, but um, that could be the only way there's a controversy, because the King James Bible is so clear about these things. So we're going to start at verse number 26, the second story of Philip. So Philip is told now to go somewhere else. Um, in verse 26, the Bible says, And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise, and go towards the south, unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is, which is desert. And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, an eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure, and had come to Jerusalem for to worship, was returning, the eunuch was returning, and sitting in his chariot read, Esaias the prophet, that's Isaiah, that's uh, the, the New Testament name of Isaiah. Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Esaias, and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, this is what the eunuch replies to Philip. So basically Philip goes up to him and he sees that he's reading the Bible, and he says, Do you know what you're reading? Do you understand what you're reading? And this is what the eunuch says. He says, how can I, except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. The title of the sermon tonight is, Why We Do What We Do. This is such a great story in the Bible explaining why we, as a, a Bible-preaching church, a soul-winning church, that, that that's our whole goal is to go out and preach the gospel, this is a very good story that teaches the doctrine in the Bible about why we do what we do. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. So this man says he's reading this, and he doesn't understand what he's reading. He said, how could I possibly understand this except some man should guide me, he says. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse number 12. We'll get into what he was actually reading in a few minutes, but look at 2 Corinthians, or 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse number 12. So the man says, I can't understand what he's reading. I need someone to help me, is what he says. Look at 1 Corinthians 2, verse number 12. The Bible says, Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. So this is Paul talking about the saved people in the church, and he says, We've not, we don't have the spirit of the world, he says, lowercase s. All right? He says, but we have the spirit which is of God. How? That, for, for what purpose? It says, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Look at verse 13. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth. So, here, Paul is saying, he's like, through this spirit that God has given us, the Holy Spirit, he's like, we speak not our own wisdom, but we speak God's wisdom. Does that sound familiar? But we speak, you know, we don't speak not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth. He's like, we don't go out there teaching the philosophies of men, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual so what he's saying there with spiritual things, with spiritual, the Holy Ghost teaches us. Where is the Holy Ghost? This is what you have to understand right here to get where we're going to go with this sermon. If you are saved tonight, where is the Holy Ghost? 
Your body is the temple of it. That's a, that's a clue, okay? So the Holy Ghost is in you, and the Holy Ghost is teaching you. So you can now compare spiritual things with spiritual things. So the Holy Ghost in you is kind of like a key to understanding the Bible, okay? So if you have the Holy Ghost, you can understand the Bible, all right? Well, you say, what about somebody that doesn't have the Holy Ghost? Look at verse 14. It says, but the natural man, this is the person who doesn't have the Holy Ghost. This is someone who is not saved. This right here, verse 14, is the Ethiopian eunuch right here. It says, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. Why? For they are foolishness unto him. Why are they foolishness unto him? It's like they don't make any sense unto him. It seems silly unto him. This is the world today. I mean, you don't believe this verse? Look around today. Look around today and just look at what's going on in the world and look at what people think about the Bible today. Even the simplest things in the Bible. I mean, the simplest things in the Bible are foolishness to the people in the world. I preach a sermon and I mention that, you know, a, a woman should submit to her husband, a wife should submit to her husband, and it like blows up the internet because everyone's like, that's foolishness. But that's the natural man right there. The natural man cannot receive the things of the Bible. They're foolishness unto him. All right? Neither can he know them. Why? Why can't he know them? Why can't the mat natural man understand the Bible? Why? Because they are spiritually discerned. So what the Bible here is saying is the Bible's a spiritual book. The Bible's a spiritual book. First of all, I don't believe that anybody who's, I mean, people will lie to you about the Bible and how much they know about the Bible, like, like more than any other book ever. I don't believe that an unsaved person could actually read through, would actually read through the Bible. Because you simply can't read, look, when I was unsaved, I tried several times. I've read Genesis chapter 1 like a thousand times in my life. But you just, you get to a point where it just doesn't make any sense to you. And you're just like, you just stop, is what happens. But you'll find unsaved people out there that just lie to you. Like, oh yeah, I've read the Bible, you know, X amount of times or whatever. But there's no way you're going to sit there and read, you know, the entire, you know, 66 books of the Bible and, and just like not understand anything. I mean, that's a really determined person right there. Okay, because it's spiritually discerned. And if you're not saved, you don't have the Holy Spirit, you can't understand it. Turn to Romans chapter 10. Do you know what? How can people understand it then? I mean, that seems kind of like a non-starter. I mean, people can't understand the Bible, so how are people supposed to get saved? I mean, that's, that's some rule to make, God. You know, how are, it means you can't sit down and just read the Bible and figure it all out yourself as an unsaved person. No, the Bible says the natural man will not receive the words of God. They, they, they won't make any sense to, the, to him. Okay, he won't be able to understand it. And look, I, 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 can, I can relate to this. I can relate to this. If you got saved later in life, you know, if you got saved when you were six or seven years old, you probably can't relate to this. But if you got saved later in life, you can relate to this because you know that, like, the Bible just opened to you when you got saved. It was like a door was opened and just, like, everything made sense. And look, a big part of that, a big part of that, not to go off on this, a big part of that is, is understanding the correct gospel, too. Because if you don't understand the correct gospel and you don't get saved, look, the only way the Bible makes sense is if you have the gospel correct, which makes sense because then you would get saved, you're sealed by the Holy Spirit, become the temple of the Holy Ghost, and bam, now you have the key to understand. You can compare spiritual things with spiritual but go to Romans chapter 10. So how are people supposed to know? You know, it's, it's an exact fit to what's happening in Acts chapter 8, what I'm about to teach you. Look at Romans chapter 10, verse 13. Romans chapter 10 and verse 13. Remember now that we go soul winning and we read these certain verses to people all the time. But you should go back in your Bible and you should read, you know, read the chapters that your, your soul winning verses are coming from, from time to time. So you always, you know, kind of keep the context of these verses and what they actually mean. Look at Romans chapter 10 and verse number 9. The Bible, I mean, this is the soul winning verse right here that we use all the time. That, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, this is after we've preached the gospel, we've checked out, hey, did they believe it? You've gone through the beginning to the end with them. Do you believe these things? And now you're going to explain to them, like, if you believe these things, 
God just wants you to ask for it. He wants you to tell him you believe these things. He wants you to confess it with your mouth. But it's, it's connected directly to believe in thine heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So the confession with your mouth comes with believing. But now let's, look, let's just read a couple verses down. Look at verse number 13. Verse number 13. Verse number 13 of Romans chapter 10 says this. It says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Look at verse 14. So here the Bible is saying, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Was there believe on the Lord in that verse? It's not in there. I'll explain that in just a couple minutes. But look at what it says here. So it says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So if you call upon the name of the Lord, you're saved. The Bible says in verse 13. Now look at verse 14. It says, so the key, I mean, you got to call on him, all right, to be saved. But how shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? Okay, there's the connection there, all right? Okay, so how, they're not going to call on him unless they believed, the Bible says. All right, now keep reading. And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? Okay, so not heard means it implies that someone has spoken it to you, first of all. Okay, and how shall they, and again, it just reinforces this idea right here, how shall they hear without a preacher? That's a person, that's a person with the Holy Spirit, just as 1 Corinthians chapter 2 is talking about speaking the words, not his own philosophy, not man's philosophy, but speaking the words of God. This is what it's talking about. It says, how shall they hear? They can't believe until they've heard, and they can't hear until someone's preached to them. Okay, and now look at verse 15. It says, and how shall they preach except they be sent? Okay, so as it is written, how beautiful are the feet, here it is again, of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring, this, this implies, you see, there's people doing this. Bring the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings, preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. It's literally talking about people here. It's talking about, it makes a point to say, their feet, they're going, they're walking, they're going, and they're speaking the words of God. This is what's happening. They're speaking, people are hearing, they're believing, and they're calling on the Lord. Okay? The point is here is that God uses us to preach his word. God uses us to preach the gospel. I mean, I'll just read you a few verses. Mark 16, 15. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's the Great Commission right there. Acts 10, 42. And he commanded us to preach unto the people. Us. And to testify, it is he that was ordained of God to be the judge of the quick and the dead. He commanded us to do it. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, Paul says to the church, which he also which also ye have received. They heard it, they believed it. He's saying that they received it, and wherein ye stand. All that to say this, folks, God's model, it is so clear in the Bible, God's model is for people to preach to other people. Saved people with the Holy Spirit preaching God's word to unsaved people. And that's exactly what we see playing out in, in the Acts chapter 8 with Philip going to the Ethiopian eunuch. And what Philip does going to him and preaching to him and what the eunuch says to Philip matches this exactly. He says, how could I understand unless someone would explain it to me? All right? Now look, here come in all these philosophical debates that I've heard like over the last you know, a couple of years, like, can someone get saved by reading a tract? You know, where people say, like, you know, but here's the thing. You say, and I might have a little different answer to this question than a lot of people, but here's the thing. I reject the question. You say, why? You say, because that's not the point. Most of the time, people pushing the philosophy and asking that question, I'm more like, why are you asking that question? When somebody asks the question, well, I think, you know, you look at somebody who says, I think people can get saved by just reading a tract. My, my question is, 
Why are you asking that question? God's model is very clear here. Not only do we have the, the, the doctrine that I read to you, but we actually have an example in the Bible of an apostle carrying out this doctrine. So my question is, why is someone asking the question? That's the, that's the smarter question, to answer that question with a question. Why are you asking that question? And the reason that, peop, that the, the root of that question is coming from people that they don't want to preach the gospel, they just want to go door hangers. How many churches are out there that don't actually preach the gospel? They don't actually go out and confront people with the gospel, and they just want to like hand out tracts and you know, hand a door hanger uh, on that. Look, I re can someone get saved by reading a tract? I reject the question. Because the question itself is rooted from people that are, are trying to attack the, the idea of preaching the gospel, which is the clear model that God wants us to do. And that's why we will always be confrontational soul winners here. I'm not talking confrontational by like, we're confrontational. I'm talking about we're always going to go out, always, at this church, and we are always going to preach the actual gospel out of our mouths to anyone that wants to hear it. Always be what we do here. Why? Because that's God's model, what he told us to do. That's why. So don't ask silly questions that, that imply that maybe that's not what we should be doing. Okay? And look, we point them to a video. If they don't want to hear, we point them to a video, and they could watch that video, and that person in the video could preach that gospel to them. So, I mean, we do that as well. But we're never going to be the church that just goes out and hangs door hangers, ever. Not as long as I'm the pastor here. We will always go out and preach the gospel to people. All right, here's another one. Here's another philosophical question that has come up in the last, I don't know who's, who's, who's thinking about these questions, but here's another one. What if someone doesn't call upon the Lord? The question is, what, what, if, what if someone believes on Jesus but doesn't call upon the Lord? Huh? What about that? Well, let me show you, let's, let me show you a contradiction in the Bible. Go to Romans chapter 10, verse 13. And then put your other finger in Acts chapter 16 in verse number 30. Let's see if we have a contradiction in the Bible here. All right, look at Acts chapter 16 and verse 30. And then keep a finger in Romans chapter 10 and verse 13. All right, so here's what the Bible says. In Romans 10, 13, we just read this, okay? And you're going to keep your place in Acts 16. The Bible says in Romans 10, 13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So here the Bible says, if you call upon the name of the Lord, you're saved. Okay? And of course, in the verse above that, in verse, I won't even give the answer away to right now, but Acts chapter 16 says in verse 30, it says, and brought them out and says, sirs, this is the, the Philippian jailer. Or he's, he's, he's bringing the disciples out. He wants to be saved too. And, and he asks this direct question and brought them out and says, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Very direct question. How do I get saved, man? I want to go to heaven too. How do I be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. We have a contradiction in the Bible here? Because one verse says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and the other verse says, call upon the name of the Lord. Well, what does Romans 10.9 say? Romans 10.9 says, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth, that's calling upon the Lord, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him to the dead. Here's the thing. If you believe on the Lord, you are going to call on him. What you say, like 99%, 99%, 100%. 100% of the time. Anyone that believes on the Lord will call upon the Lord. It, it, it's really that simple. So I reject that question, too. Because, I mean, look, you will run into people. You will run into people out soul winning. If you're, if you're soul winning long enough, it, you don't have to soul win that long, actually, to have this happen. But you'll run into somebody that, you know, doesn't want to pray. You know, when, when you're done giving the gospel. You give the gospel, and you go through, and you check, and make sure they believe every point, and then, like, they don't want to pray. They don't want to pray. Well, you got, two, you got one of two situations on your hands here. Either they don't believe, and I think that's the majority of them, by the way. I think the majority of people that, I mean, this is my opinion, just my experienced opinion, okay? I believe the majority of people that, you know, just they, you explain the gospel to them, they, they 
they believe everything or they tell you they believe everything and then they don't want to pray, they don't want to, you know, ask God to save them, I, I believe that they, they don't really believe. I mean, most of the time. I mean, yes, there's those people that are embarrassed to, in, to pray in front of you. But you will find those people too. And those people, what I do in those cases, and I'm just like, hey, you don't have to pray in front of me. Okay, this isn't a magic prayer that you have to say in front of the guy at the door. Okay, but I tell them like, hey, as soon as I leave this door, you go in your bedroom or you go in a room by yourself and you just tell God you believe these things and you ask him to save you. And look, if they believed it, they'll do it. They'll do it. I mean, think about it this way. Here's an analogy for you. And, and there's no analogy that's good enough to explain salvation. Okay, but basically somebody that would believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, that would believe that they were a sinner and that they deserved, that they were like literally one heartbeat away from an eternity in torment and hell and you got that across to them that they deserve to go to hell and their breath could stop at any minute and they would be there for eternity and you got that across to them that that's what they deserved and then you explain to them that God sent his son to take their pun to take the punishment for their sin and that God lived a perfect life and he he suffered on the cross and he became you know sin for them and he bare their sin in his own body, and that he died and, and rose again from the dead, and all they have to do is trust in that to get themselves out of this mess that they're in, and they believe that, and yet they're, they're not like, like they're, they're going to they're gonna, they're gonna ask for it. If you got it across to them and they believed it, they're going to ask for it. It's like, here's the analogy, it's like somebody falling off, falls off a cliff. They're falling off a cliff, and they're, they're, they're floating down this cliff, and they've got enough time falling off this cliff to realize, I'm hitting those rocks down there, and I'm dead. I am a dead man. And then somebody jumps out after they've realized that they're, they are in, they're in for certain death as they're floating off that cliff. Somebody jumps out and miraculously somehow catches them and saves them from that certain death when they're five feet from the rocks. And that situation happens, and, and you put that person down after you've caught them, and you put them down, and they say nothing to you, and they walk away. Would that ever happen? Of course not. They would be like, thank you for catching me. I was almost dead. Like, you saved me. They would be so thankful. They would be praising you. They would be saying, thank you. They were saying, I was in for certain death. How in the world? Did you know that I was falling? I mean, they would have all kinds of things to say. There would be not one single person who that would happen to, who, who would get caught and saved at the last moment, who would just walk away and say nothing. It would never happen. So again, it's a ridiculous question. Because if somebody calls upon the name of the Lord, they've done so because they believed. The two things are coupled together. You can't have one. You won't have one without the other. Okay, so if somebody, I mean, if somebody doesn't, if somebody doesn't want to pray with you at the door, either they didn't get it, they didn't really believe it, or, you know, it, it could be that they're just embarrassed to, to pray in front of you. You'll, you'll run into those, those people as well. But most of the time, if you do a good job, especially explaining the situation, this is why you really need to spend some time up front, you know, explaining to people the condition that they're in. If you spend that few minutes up front, soul winning, talking to somebody, look, most people will just readily admit that they're a sinner. They readily admit that they've broken God's law. But if you spend that time up front showing them what they deserve for that, you will have them for as long as you need to explain the, the rest of the gospel to them. Because they're like, oh man, I, I'm in serious trouble here. Please tell me how to get out of it. And then they will pray. And so the point is, we are always going to go out and preach to people. We are always going to go out and preach the gospel to whoever wants to listen. And we are always going to offer to help people call upon the name of the Lord. We're always going to offer to help people do that. It's a valuable point. If somebody that has believed the gospel, even if we wouldn't like offer to do that with them, they would do it anyway you know, on their own or, or after we leave in their mind, if they realize, you know, like what has happened to them, they, they would do it anyway. But the point is, it gives them a nice moment where they can realize like, yeah, that's, that's where my salvation was, you know. But the point is, you're not going to have one 
without the other. Turn to Titus chapter 3. Turn to Titus chapter 3. So look, the point is that all these silly questions and these silly, you know, you know, f philosophical, you know, questions, it's really more about, it's really, it's, it's really less about how you would answer that question, and it's more about why the person is asking that question. And, and that, that's what you really, that, that's what the intelligent person really needs to think about. Like, why, why are you saying that, why would you, like, uh, it's obvious in the Bible that it is God's plan for someone to go and preach the gospel. That it is our purpose. Look, it's why we do what we do in our lives. It's why I'm out today in 105 degree whatever it is out there, like suffering. You know, but it, I mean, it's not really suffering. But I mean, the point is, is it's why we do what we do. Because that, I mean, everyone's like, oh man, what's the purpose of life, bro? That's the purpose of life right there. It's to get saved and go out and get other people saved. Bro, that's the purpose of life. Isn't it nice that we don't have to like just bother ourselves with all these stupid, philosophical, weird things that people like spend their whole lives on? I mean, is there a God? What's the meaning, man? You know, all this stuff. It's like, no, we know. We know what the meaning is. We know what it is. So all these stupid philosophical questions, you kind of have to just ask, yourself, why are you asking that question? It's clear that God wants us to go preach. Why would you say that we don't need to preach? Why would you be asking a question that implies that we don't need to preach? Right? That's the more important thing to realize there. Look at Titus chapter 3 and verse number 9. This is, this is the category that I put those types of questions in. It says, but avoid foolish questions. Why would I need to know the answer to that stupid question? Because I know what God is telling me to do. Because I know what I'm supposed to do. I don't need to know the, the special circumstance of every single person that's ever been saved on planet Earth throughout history. All I need to know is the very clear teaching that God tells me the whole purpose of my life is to go out and teach and preach the gospel to people who are the natural man and can't understand it themselves. That's all I need to know. I don't have to waste any horsepower on that type of stuff. That's what Titus 3.9 is saying. It says, Avoid, avoid this stuff. Because why? And genealogies and contentions and strivings. People will just like strive over this stuff about the law. For they're what? They're unprofitable and vain. Then there's all the people that come up with dumb questions just so you can think, you know, they, that they're smart or something. But the point is, like, these two specific questions, I believe, actually have like a sinister origin right here. So that's the more important you know, that's the more important, I answer that question, which with, where did that question come from? Because it's very clear that we are to go out and preach with our feet. We are to preach the gospel, right? I mean, Acts chapter 8, Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch, look, it's a testimony of our lives. Think about it that way. It's a testimony of what we are supposed to be doing. Go back to Acts chapter 8. Go back to Acts chapter 8. Look at verse 32. So let's see. Let's see how it plays out. Let's, now that we know the doctrine, we know what we're supposed to be doing, let's see how it actually plays out in practice. I mean, this is, this is such a beautiful story in the Bible because not only does God give us all this doctrine, but then he gives us an example of how it works. Look at verse 32. It says, The place of Scripture which he read was this, He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shear, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation for his life is taken from the earth? This is what he's reading. He's reading Isaiah 53. Okay, he's reading Isaiah 53. In Isaiah 53, the first 10 verses or, you know, of that is just like it's all just this messianic prophecy. Okay, he's just quoting just Isaiah 53 just verbatim here. He's reading it, and look what he says in verse 34. He says, And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this? Of himself or of some other man? He's reading Isaiah 53, which is this, it's just one of the best messianic prophecies in the Old Testament. Just, just Jesus fulfilled every bit of it, and he's just like, who is he talking about? And what does Philip do? Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture 
and preached unto him Jesus. So here we have, you know, we're, we have this implication that this guy, this guy understands the idea of, you know, the Messiah and all this kind of stuff. He just doesn't know who it is. He understands, you know, he was in Jerusalem worshiping. He has some understanding. He's actually trying to read the Old Testament. He has some understanding of the, the basic philosophies. He just doesn't know who the Messiah is. So what does Philip do? He preaches him the gospel. He preaches Jesus to him. Look at verse 36. And he preached unto him Jesus. And look, he got it. He connected the dots. Look at, he connected the dots for him. Look at verse 36. It says, and they went on their way, and they came unto certain water, and the eunuch said, so, I mean, we don't even know, like, if, if he really believed it at this point, right? All we know is that Philip preached to him, right? We don't know if he received it. We don't know if he believed Philip. We, we don't have any idea at this point in the story. But as they went on their way, they came upon certain, unto certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? So here the eunuch sees water, and he wants to be baptized. So I'm sure Philip preached him all that doctrine. I mean, Philip probably preached to him for quite a while. Between verse 35 and verse 36 was probably some serious preaching right there. This guy knows that he, that he wants to be baptized at this point. And he says, What is stopping me from being baptized? And then we have the most hated verse in the whole Bible right here, or the most attacked verse in the whole Bible, verse 37, where Philip says, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. You know what he means? He, he means, if thou believest on Jesus. If thou trusts in Jesus. Many times I will say, explaining trust in Jesus, I will say, it has to be 100% Jesus, 0% you. It can't be 1% you, 99% Jesus, 98% Jesus, 2% you. No, it's all or nothing, which is exactly what Philip says right here. Same gospel. Same gospel. But look, if, if you have a Bible, that, I mean, here's the thing. Like, look at verse 37. It says, what does he have to do? What, what would hinder him to be baptized? And he's like, the only thing that you need to be baptized is if you believe with all your heart in Jesus. Basically, if you're saved. Okay? He's saying, in order to be baptized, you have to be saved. Look, if you have a Bible that has verse 37 in it, as I just read it to you, could you ever baptize a baby? I mean, what did the eunuch do here? Look at verse, uh, look at the end of verse 37. I'm sorry, I, I didn't even read it all. Look at, and he answered and said, what does he do then? So he says, if you believe us with all your heart. So the belief, the belief is where? Can I really tell what you believe? I can't see what you believe. You know, the Bible talks about this in James 1 and James 2, talking about how, like, as men, how, how I can, the only way I can see your belief is through your actions. Right? The only way, that's why a lot of people say, like, man, that guy just does all this wicked stuff. Like, I don't even think he's saved. You know, because, like, that's the only way men can see your faith. Like, I can't, I can't see your heart. I can't see anyone's heart. Right? But look, he, he says, but then he, what does he do here? He says, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. You know what he did, just did right there? He confessed with his mouth. Did those two things go together? Of course. It's, it's a perfect example of the doctrines in Romans chapter 10, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and all throughout the New Testament. So the point is, could you ever baptize a baby if you had verse 37 in your Bible? You couldn't because, I mean... He believed, number one, can a baby believe? Can a baby believe? Can a baby trust? Can a baby confess with his mouth? Can a baby say, I mean, it's ridiculous. But that's why they remove it from the Bible. Because they're like, you know, actually in, in the Lutheran church, when a baby is baptized, and I've seen this like, I don't know, a million times in my life, the church confesses for the child. It's the weirdest thing. And I even thought it was weird when it was happening. We're just like, that doesn't seem right. But, you know, the, the whole church, will, the, the pastor will say to the baby, he's holding the baby, and he's like, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? And he'll go through this whole liturgy and all this kind of stuff. And the congregation will say, we believe that you, And it's just like, weird. You're waiting for, like, the Twilight Zone music to come on. You know, it's really strange. But obviously, the baby can't confess. The baby can't believe. You could never baptize an infant if you could never have the Catholic doctrine. So why do they do it? It's very easy to see why the Catholics did this. 
because it's a control thing. The Catholics, that's, that's the philosophy of the Catholic Church from the beginning. You have to come to us to go to heaven. You see? We can't have people believing. That's why they kill people with Bibles. That's why they would burn villages where they found Bibles there. We can't have people reading the Bible and figuring out that and having people teach out of the Bible that you can be saved just by what you believe. We can't have that. We need people to come here. We need people to believe that they got to walk through this door and put money in that plate to get themselves to heaven. It's, it's, a, it's a control thing is really all it is. It's very easy to see the motive there. It's the same thing with all the other doctrines. The confession to the priest, all the, I mean, how many sacraments are there now? I mean, they just seem, seem to make up sacraments after sacrament after sacrament. They made up the idea of a sacrament. The sacrament just means a work attached to the gospel. That's all it means. A sacrament means we got, hey, it's not of works, but, you know, the, the means of grace, the sacrament, it's basically works bolted onto the gospel. That's a sacrament. And that's why so many people died throughout history over infant baptism. That's why we were called Anabaptists. That's why we were called, you know, they were making fun of us because we were baptizing again or rebaptizing. We weren't rebaptizing anybody because a baby being baptized is not baptism. It's not biblical baptism. So somebody that got saved out of the Catholic Church as a you know, 20-year-old and got baptized by a Baptist, they were only baptized once. But they, you know, they called it rebaptism. And they would, you know, they would kill them both. But it was it was bolting works onto salvation. And that's why so many people died over just this one issue, verse 37 right here. Is because it was just. Christians, it was just Bible-believing Christians taking a stand that you will add no works to the gospel. That if you add anything to the gospel, you are degrading Jesus Christ and you're accursed, as Galatians chapter 1 says. And as they were being tortured and dying, that's what they declared. And thank God um, for those martyrs as examples to us. Look at verse, um, look at verse number, number 8. Or verse 38, sorry. Verse 38. So, uh, you know, another one is, let me just go to Mark 16, 16 real quickly. Um, a lot of people will say, anybody that believes that, that baptism, because you'll find a lot of Protestant churches that actually will come out and just like straight up say, like the Church of Christ, they'll say straight up, you have to be baptized to be saved. And they'll use Mark 16, 16. So go there real quickly. Let's look at that. Mark 16, 16. Before we move on in Acts chapter 8, let me just cut that one up real quick for you. Mark 16, 16, the Church of Christ will use this. They'll say, you have to be baptized to go to heaven. I mean, and, and if, like I said, if you've been soul winning, you have met these people. Or what do you have to do to go to heaven? Well, uh, I know I'm going to heaven. Why? Because I believe in Jesus and I've been baptized. How many people have you met like that? And they, they've added, they bolted that work onto salvation. Not saved. Not good enough. There can be no works, nothing added to the gospel, folks. Because if you're trusting in yourself, why? You say, why? Because then you haven't trusted on Jesus because you're trusting in something that you've done. It's, it's a work. Look at Matt, Mark chapter 16, verse 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. <gasps> there it is, right there. Well, first of all, is that true? If somebody believes and they're baptized, are they going to heaven? Of course they are. That's a totally true statement right there. Now, if it said, he that believeth and is not baptized shall be damned, then we got a problem. But look what it says. It says, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. True. But he that, what is it that damns you? But he that believeth not shall be damned. See, folks, look. The only reason any man will ever go to hell you say, oh man, you know, everybody out there in the world, you ask somebody in the world, why would a man go to hell? Well, if he does really bad stuff. Well, if he's a murderer. Well, if he's done horrible things. Well, if he's committed all these abominations. No, the only reason that a man will ever go to hell is because he has not believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's it. That's the only reason. That's the only reason. And then, look, then, then he'll be judged by his works at the great white throne. But the only reason go to hell is because he did not believe. Mark 16, 16 is totally true. The whole verse itself. And it is not, it is not saying that you have to be baptized to be saved. It could say a, a statement, he that believeth and installs brick walls for a living it shall be saved. That's also true. 
he that believeth and never goes to church shall be saved. That, that's also true. Okay, he that believeth and any work, good or bad, shall be saved. It's basically saying, like, if you have trusted on Jesus, you know, and you're baptized, you're saved. But he that believeth not, it literally proves against baptism for salvation by the last part of the verse. So, again, it's just, but people taking Mark 16, 16, a pastor of the Church of Christ or whatever that takes Mark 16, 16 and teaches that it means you have to be baptized to be saved, it is another proof that the natural man can't understand the Word of God. And look, is, is that a complicated verse right there? I just explained it in like two and a half minutes. It's not complicated to understand even just the very simple logic of that verse. But an unsaved person will read that, and then they will hear the false doctrine of that, and that false, that false teacher will teach that, and they will, they'll think they're correct. They, they won't understand that they're even wrong because they're the natural man. They're not understanding the spiritual things. All right, go to Acts chapter 8. Let's finish up. Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8, look at verse number 38. So he, he believed. How, how do we know that he believed and he didn't lie? Because he confessed with his mouth. That's how Philip knew. He's like, he confessed with his mouth. Look at verse 38. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. So Philip, at that point, he, he de deduced in his mind that because he confessed with his mouth that he was okay to baptize him. I mean, so we have to kind of make some judgments if people get saved or not. This is why if somebody doesn't pray, you know, we don't count it as a salvation. Not like us counting a salvation really means anything in the kingdom of God. It's just kind of a metric. But it's just a way for us to say, like, yeah, we see that that person got saved. Yeah, we can see that, right? Because we can't see. And I believe, you know, that that's one of the reasons God has that attached. You know, because, like, how else would we know? I mean, we can't really see, you know, unless people tell us what they believe. We can't, we can't see the man. We can't see a man's heart. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. They went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. So he baptized him. Go to Romans chapter 6 and verse number 4. So baptism is just this, it's this picture of, you know, it's, it's, it's your first act of obedience in, in your Christian life. It's your first act of obedience in your Christian life showing, basically showing that you identify with other Christians, that you identify with this belief, and that you want to actually pursue your Christian life. Look, it's super important. It doesn't, I mean, it doesn't have anything to do with going to heaven, but being baptized is super important as far as your Christian life. It's like it's like putting the wheels on the car to get driving in the Christian life. It's, it's the first thing that you should do. Look at Romans 6, 4. The Bible says, therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. It, it literally identifies us with our Savior's death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also will definitely. No, it says we should walk in newness of life. It is, it is a it is a physical way of us showing Jesus Christ, the, the man, the God that saved us, that we are ready to serve him. That we are ready to go out and do what? We are ready to go out and do what he wants us to do. We are ready to go out and fulfill the purpose of our life, to walk in newness of life. Because like, there's not a single, here's another single uh, blanket statement I can make. There's not a single person that's unsaved that's out preaching the gospel to people getting them saved. None. Zero. There's none. So this newness of life is that you're going to get involved in the Christian life. You're going to learn how to preach the gospel because, look, this is the one thing that God wants for you. We talk about, you know, being backslidden and staying out of sin and all this stuff. And, I mean, I sit here and I just, like, rip through the Bible and just scream at you, like, how many times a week about not doing this and separating from that and this is good and these, this is bad and all the world and all this kind of stuff. Why? So you will walk in newness of life. That's why. What's the whole point? So we'll go out and preach and get people saved. That's the whole point. And baptism is the first, the first thing that we do to show um, that desire to get moving in that direction. Look at verse 39. Verse 39. 
I got to hurry up here. We're getting long winded these days. Look at verse 39. And they were come up out of the water. The spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, and the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. First of all, like, that's true too. Like, you get somebody saved, you're always, it's always a joyful thing. Like, I was just like praying out there today. I was like, man, I hope we get somebody saved because it's really hot out here. Like, I was not, I mean, look, let me confess my faults to you all. I was not having a great soul any day today. Even Jacob said something to me. He's like, Dad, he's like, man, you have a bad day. And I was just like, I don't know, I was dehydrated and I just wasn't feeling that great. Like, I was not having a great soul any day, but we got, we got somebody saved and it's like, bam, joy, right there, just like that. It's a rejoice, it's a rejoicing moment when somebody gets saved. And it's amazing how, like, when you just go anyway and somebody gets saved, it's just like, it's just such a joyful thing. So we, again, we see that with Philip. He goes away rejoicing. But Philip was found at Azotus and passed, and the eunuch saw, the eunuch was rejoicing too, okay? I'm sure they were both rejoicing. But Philip was found at Azotus, and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. All right, now, one last thing I want to say about this story. So he gets the guy saved, he preaches to him, the guy confesses with his mouth, he gets baptized, it's a great um, it's a great story. You say, but why, why this guy? Turn to verse 27, because there's an interesting, um, you know, God's, a, God's pragmatic too. All right, so God's trying to get the gospel out to the world, and I don't want to leave um, this nugget unturned here. Look at verse 27. When God tells Philip to go, look at what he says. He says, and he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, an eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure, had come to Jerusalem to worship, he was returning and sitting in his chariot read Isaiah the prophet, read Isaiah. So this guy was somebody back in Ethiopia. He was, he was like second in command. He, had the, he was the treasurer of the queen of Egypt, it says here. He had, you know, or I'm sorry, Ethiopia. The, Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, he was the treasurer. He was a very influential person. And God's like, I see that he would believe. I see his heart. He's, what is he doing? He's trying to understand the Bible. What's he doing? Turn to Matthew chapter 7. What was he doing? He's trying to understand the Bible. He's trying to understand, like, who is this person? Who is this person? Is he talking about somebody else? Is he talking about himself? Is it the Messiah? What's he talking about? You know what he was doing? He was seeking. He was seeking. And God, this is another great example of how God works right here. He was an important person. God wanted this guy to get saved so he could go and deliver this message to Ethiopia, to Africa. So it's good that he gets saved. I mean, look, we never, you never know what God's going to set up for you as a soul winner, by the way, because God needs you. Look at verse number 7 of Matthew chapter 7. Ask, and it shall be given unto you. Seek, and ye shall find. So here's another thing, and this is kind of, um, th here's another philosophical question that people will ask. What about that kid in Africa? How many times have you heard this question? What about that kid in Africa who had never had the chance to, you know, hear the gospel? And, you know, you're somebody in the world that just lived under a tree, you know, or whatever. First of all, the kids are not, until they realize the law, the kids are fine. Okay, they're not condemned until they realize the law. Paul tells us that in Romans. But what about that person that is just in a tribe somewhere or whatever? But here's the thing. The Bible tells us, if you seek, you shall find. You know what that is? That's a promise right there. What was the Ethiopian eunuch doing? He was seeking. He was seeking the truth. Okay, now turn to Matthew chapter 9. So I hope I can get this two points here at the end across to you. But here's my belief on this. If someone in the world anywhere is seeking, is, is trying to find the truth of what God's word says, on how they can be saved, how they can go to heaven, God will send someone to them. 100%. Because that's what the Bible says. That's what we see with Philip and the eunuch. We have a man that was seeking. And you say, you, you sound pretty adamant about this. Yeah, because you know what? That's what happened to me. I was literally, I mean, I don't know, it, it, it's probably a similar story to yourselves. I was literally seeking. I was literally confused. I saw contradictions with what I believed. I was, a, I was a mature adult, and I was seeking the truth, and God led me to someone who showed me the truth. Pastor Stephen Anderson is the person that showed me the truth through his online ministry. 
So the point I'm trying to get you to understand is if, if somebody is seeking, they will find. That's a promise in the Bible. And that's what we see demonstrated with Philip in the Ethiopian eunuch. But now go to Matthew chapter 9 and verse 37. So you're saying, what are we, Calvinists? Are we Calvinists to say, like, it's just a guarantee that every single person that can get saved will get saved? No. You say, why? Because is everyone seeking? Is everyone, at, have you been soul winning out here? I was telling my wife today, I mean, I'm going to write a whole sermon on, on, on this neighborhood we're in today. Because it's just like, if there is, is there is any, if there's one word to describe, you know, and obviously there was uh, salvation, so that's great, but if there's one word to describe Americans today, it's just complacency. It's just nobody cares about anything. Nobody's seeking truth. Nobody, I'm not saying nobody, but I'm just saying most people are just like, here's the thing, we're too comfortable. We're too comfortable. So there's a lot of people that aren't seeking. They're not actively seeking. Look at Matthew chapter 9, and verse 37. Then he said unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. You know what that implies? Verse 39, verse 38. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. You know what that implies? That there's this huge harvest, and there's very few laborers. You know what that means? It means we won't get them all. But what if they're seeking? We'll get those. But they're not all seeking. But guess what? If you go to the door, I mean, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, in verse number 11, it says, you know, knowing the terror of the Lord, what do we do? We persuade men. We go and we persuade people. We find somebody that's not necessarily seeking. Maybe they're just like, they're indifferent. Maybe they never even really thought about it. And they're just like, yeah, I got some time. I'll listen. And you know what you do? You persuade them. And during that conversation, they're like, oh, man. I need this. At that point, they start seeking in that conversation. And then that person will get saved. You have to persuade them to, to be seeking. You have to persuade them to want to know how to get themselves out of this mess. If you can't, if you can't even get somebody to the point where they, need to, they, they want to seek the truth, that person's just not going to get saved. But the point I'm trying to get at, somebody who's actively seeking without anyone even coming to their door, God is going to send someone for them to get saved. That's what the Bible is teaching us here. And that's what the Bible is showing us with Philip in the eunuch. It's an example of that. But for somebody, for somebody that's just like indifferent, that would believe if somebody explained and persuaded it to them from the Bible, we're going to miss a lot of those people. You know why? Because the laborers are few. Why would Jesus have said that? Why do you have said that? He's like, pray ye therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. He's saying, look, you need to pray for more. Why would we need to pray for more if it's already just a done deal? We need more. Why? Because if we don't, look, anybody that gets out of soul winning, people are going to hell for that. That's, that's how serious it is. This is why we do what we do. Because we will miss part of the harvest if, if, the, if there's fewer laborers. So that's what you have to, I mean, that's how serious your Christian life is. That's why you have a pastor and, and other Bible preaching pastors will get up and they'll just like, they just like, just exhort you to stay in the Christian life, get sold out for the Christian life, get going. Why? Because of the harvest, that's why. I mean, that's really, it really boils down to that brass tack right there, the harvest. And if, if, if we have fewer laborers, we'll get fewer sheaves. It's, it's very simple. It's very simple. That's the importance, folks. That's the importance of soul winning. That's the importance of, you know, the gospel. That's the importance of this doctrine that, that it's God's philosophy that we go and do it. And that's what he's showing us with Philip in the Ethiopian eunuch. It's just like, it's just like built, not bought. He's not going to do that. He, he saved us, Okay. But we have to go and, and harvest in this world. It's the design that God put forth for us to do it. He's like, you know what? You go get them. Like the harvest, there's, there's plenty of them out there. And guess what? There's plenty of them out there. Nearly every time we go out, we, we will get people saved. Nearly every time. And nearly every time, look, sometimes you go out, you will, you will find those, and I call them divine appointments. When you find somebody who's just like, and it, it's really cool to see those. You'll find those divine appointments 
where you meet that person at the door and they're just like, man, I've been studying this. I mean, you will meet the Ethiopian eunuch at the door. It's totally awesome. Like, I've been studying this. I don't know. My church is teaching me this. It doesn't make any sense. Let me show you. Bam, easy. That's a divine appointment. That's an Ethiopian eunuch right there. But then you'll find people that are just like, yeah, I'll, I'll listen. I've always kind of wondered about that. They're not really seeking, but they're just the harvest. And we're out there getting the harvest. All right? So look, we have to go out. We have to preach. We have to persuade and uh, find the people that are seeking. And the ones that aren't, we, we need to convince them and persuade them to start seeking. These are the seeds that we can plant, too. You may not necessarily get everybody, somebody saved the first time. I didn't get saved the first time I heard it. But you plant those seeds. You show them the truth and they start, the wheels start turning in their head. And they're like, oh, that makes a lot of sense. And then they start seeking. And then they eventually will get saved. If, as long as they seek, they will find. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.